a few messages that I'd like to um, put out. Tomorrow night at 8 p.m. in the same space here, Mildred Friedman from the Walker Art Museum is going to give a lecture and slide presentation on the Distill show that she opened up there, which has traveled on to Washington and is now in Holland. It's a free lecture again, and you are all welcome to come and listen to it. Next Wednesday night, same time and place, Raymond Abraham from New York will continue our series with a lecture on his work and on his drawings. So that will be a week from tonight, next Wednesday. And lastly, we urge you all to go over to our gallery and view the exhibit of Daniel Liebskin's drawings and prints if you have not yet done so. Uh, we're going to open the show up this evening after the lecture, and the show will run through November 9th. It's located at the end of the drive next to Olympic Boulevard, so do please come by. Three weeks ago, when we introduced the lecture series, we mentioned some general interests that had guided our selection of speakers. One of those was the connection of art to architecture on an ideological level, perhaps even a socio-political one. Tonight, we are proud to have with us an artist who has been assaulting social and artistic boundaries and questioning conventional notions since he began strolling the avenues of art in the late 1960s. His name is Vito Acconci. And that's a name that's had a profound influence on the contemporary concepts of art. For the past 13, 14 years, his work has developed from primarily psychological concerns of breaking down the accepted limits of one's own self to sociological concerns, as in his most recent work, which are architectural constructs that continue to question directly our notions of space and our relationships to it. Vito's done many performances and set up a lot of situations throughout Europe and North America in a variety of settings. On piers at one o'clock in the morning, in Wise, under gallery floors, and in major university and city museums. He teaches, makes films, and has been written about extensively. Please welcome Vito Acconci. Okay, what, uh, what I'd like to do basically is give a kind of quick survey of work over the last 12 years or so, hopefully concentrating on, uh, on, rec on recent stuff. Uh, uh, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about background, because my background, <clears throat> my background wasn't a visual arts background, but a writing background. And until 1968 or so, stuff appeared in a context of writing, context of poetry. Uh, the kinds of things that interested me when I was writing, thanks. Uh, the kinds of things that interested me when I was writing were, was basically the notion of a the notion of a page as a kind of as a kind of literal space to move over. So the things that interested me were questions like, how do you move from left margin of the page to right margin? How do you move from one page to the net to the net to the next page? So in other words, what interested me about words were to use words as a kind of prop for movement, prop for travel, prop for my act of movement as writer on the page, then in turn, your act of, your act of, your act of, movement, of movement as reader. So because I was interested in words as a kind of prop for movement, the choice of words became, the choice of words became important. For example, uh, it was impossible for me, I, I found it impossible to use words like words like tree, words like chair, because this referred to another space, a space off the page. Whereas I could use words like there, then, at that time, in that place. In other words, words that referred to my act of writing on the page, then in turn, your act, your act, your act, your act of reading the page. So in other words, I was probably, uh, towards the end of the time I was writing, probably writing myself, driving myself into a kind of corner into a kind of position where the only kind of things that could be used that wouldn't spoil the literalness of the page were commas, punctuation points, whatever. So there was a kind of necessary leap. Stuff started to, stuff started to refer to, stuff started to refer to some activity of mine off the page. And I guess one of the last pieces of mine that I thought of as a piece of writing 
was something done uh, around the around the end around the end of '68, uh, a poem that consisted of uh, a book, uh, 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 a page from a book on reading speed, how to improve reading speed, and the title given to the thing was something like the the time taken for me to walk from such and such a street at such and such a time to such and such a street at such and such a time. In other words, an attempt to make page space somewhat equivalent to street space, an attempt to make uh, reading time somewhat equivalent to walking time. So it was clear to me by that point that if I was so interested in this question of movement, uh, why was, I, why was I limiting this movement to a page? And the only reason I could give myself was that up until that moment, up until that time, it hadn't occurred to me to question the fact that I was a writer. In 68, uh, in 68 at, least for the, at least for the first time that I was aware, uh, galleries, exhibition places, art context places were starting to show written, stu written stuff on the wall. You can name any number of names, Wiener, Kasuth, Robert Barry, whatever. Uh, so that even though when I first started showing stuff in an art context that didn't involve writing, the fact that uh, art context places were showing writing made that an available field for me. Whereas at another time, I probably would have thought much more rigidly in terms of page, book, page, book, publication. So in other words, whatever, whatever internal changes were going on in the work that seemed to make a change of context necessary, I'm not sure if those internal changes would even have been recognized by me if it weren't for the fact that that, that external changes were, were occurring. In other words, something in the air was making it possible for me to notice that, that uh, I didn't have to restrict something to one field, that these other, fi that these other fields were there. Okay, um, so in 68 and 69, I was in a position something like uh, all my life up until that time I had been used to thinking that I knew what my ground was. My ground was this piece of paper in front of me. So now I was in this position where, where I wasn't going to use this, this page anymore. So I was in a position of something like having my ground slip out from under me or making my ground slip out from under me. So that a lot of the first pieces, a lot of the first pieces in an art context probably had to do with that general, that general question in the background. Now that I don't have my accustomed ground anymore, now that I don't have this piece of paper, now that I'm in real space, now that I'm in actual space, what gives me a reason to be there? What gives me a reason to move there? So a lot of the first pieces in, 1960, in 1969 sort of set as their general scheme uh, something that would that would tie me into actual space, someone, something that would give me a reason to be in actual, in actual space. Uh, some, exa some examples. Uh, oh. Okay, uh, this, was a, this was a piece done, at the, uh, done in the fall of 1969, a piece that the Architectural League, uh, a, a piece for a program that the Architectural League of New York held a program called Streetworks, in which a number of people were asked during, during the period of a month to do a piece involving the street, specifically, specifically New, York, New York streets. And at that time, and maybe I should just mention, uh, mention this because it's something, it, it, it's probably a, a typical way I've always worked and it's probably continued uh, continued in recent work, no matter how the recent work has changed, probably my way of going about doing a piece is a kind of, is almost kind of dumbly, doggedly looking at the parameters of a situation and trying to do something with those parameters. For example, this was a show, this was a show that was going to last a month, and it was a show that used the streets, New York streets. So theoretically, in the back of my mind, I wanted to do something that would that would, that would take place over the entire month, and something that also potentially would use all the space available, something that would potentially use all the streets, all the, all the, street, all the streets and all the streets, all, all, the, all the streets in New York. So the piece I did involved this scheme. Uh, uh, each day, uh, I would, I would, each day I, for the month, I would pick out at random a person in the street, and each day I would follow a person follow a different person until, until that person entered a private place 
home, office, whatever, so that I could, so that, I, so that, I, so that, so that I couldn't follow. So that following episodes would range from, say, two or three minute episodes when someone might get into a car and I couldn't follow, ranging from that to say. Uh, uh, seven or eight hour episodes when someone might go to a restaurant, a movie, whatever. Okay, so with regard to the, the general, with regard to the general question I had set for myself, uh, now that I'm in real space, what gives me a reason to be there? Doing pieces that had schemes like this gave me that, gave me that reason. Once I had picked on this scheme, decisions of time and space were out of my hands. I could be tied into another person's time and space. I could be sort of dragged along by another, dragged along by another, another, another person. One other example of the, the, this early, sta early, early stage of pieces. Uh, this was a piece on a few months after that, a piece called Service Area. I guess it was the first occasion of, uh, the first time a piece of mine was in a museum context. And at that time, I think for people whose work was starting to appear at the end of the 60s, the notion of a museum was, the notion of museum was problematic to a lot of us in the sense that uh, museum space seemed to represent isolation space, separation space. I think a lot of us were struck by, uh, I was struck by a kind of 60s, especially university museum, university museum architecture. The Berkeley Museum might be an example. Uh, the Whitney Museum in New York is an example. Uh, the museum is a kind of fortress. The museum, the museum, the museum is this kind of reinforced concrete, concrete, concrete building. No windows visible from the out, from the out, from the outside. Therefore, a building that separated the space inside from outside. Okay, so with regard to the kind of stuff I was doing at the time, that involved a kind of casual space, a kind of every, a kind of everyday time. The notion of a museum seemed the opposite of this. So when the occasion came to do something in a museum. The way I would sort of normally approach, or almost naturally approach the thing was uh, to try to find a way to connect museum space, this isolation space, to my everyday life space. So the way I did it was probably a, a possibly overly simple way. Uh, the piece involved, uh, for the duration of the show, three months, whatever, uh, I arranged that my mail be forwarded by the post office to the museum so that my space in the museum would be used as my mailbox, so that whenever I wanted mail, whenever I needed mail, I would have to go up to the museum to get it. So a kind of basic way of, of making museum space part of the space I would, ordinar I would ordinarily use. Okay, so a lot, of the, a lot of the first pieces then probably had as their, as if you could apply a, a, a language to it, the language would be something like, I, a person, attends to it a world considered as if it's there, out there. So I, person, agent, try to find a way to key myself into this already existent system. Try to find a way to tie myself into this already existent system. So in other words, the first pieces were probably, in, were, were probably involved with my trying to, my trying to uh, f almost find the space, the, space, the space around me almost a uh, kind of maybe self as a kind of system of feelers that could connect itself to, to, to a, space, a space around. The next stage of pieces then, uh, the movement started to change. Rather than I attending to it, a world out there, I guess I thought, well, since I was using my own person in pieces, maybe rather than the there quality, maybe the pieces had to start, had to start being involved with with their source, their starting point. If I was using my own person in pieces, maybe the pieces had to be, had to be something, something about the development of a kind of personness, the development of a kind of self. So the motion of pieces started to change. The motion of pieces became, became the motion of pieces became more circular. Rather than I attend to it, I attend to me. I concentrate on me. I focus, I focus on myself. And the obvious question was, okay, if, if the pieces are gonna be about concentration on self, how do I prove this? 
both to myself and others? How do I show both myself and others that I'm concentrating on myself? One obvious way is to do something physical to myself, apply some kind of stress to myself. So the pieces in the beginning of, seven, of, 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 of 1970 then all involved applying some kind of stress to the body. The body then adjusting according to that stress, adapting, adapting because of that, because of that stress, almost sort of possibly changing itself because of that, because of that stress. One or two, one or two examples. Uh, a film called Openings. This is sort of one part of the film. Uh, it almost starts as a kind of uh, as a kind of film joke. Uh, something starts. Something starts. Uh, something starts closed. Then you o then you open it. So the film has this camera camera focused on my stomach. In the beginning of the film, my stomach is covered with hair. The film is involved with me pulling the hair out around my navel so that by the end of the film, the film frame is cleared. Film frame began began closed, covered with hair, ends opened, uh, bare stomach. Uh, another example, uh, obviously, uh, maybe it's sort of the way I talk about it, so maybe it was revealing something that was going on at the time. Uh, probably when I began the pieces, I was trying almost desperately to think of them in kinds of uh, neutral physical terms, it was obvious that some that something else was going on. That this physical was obviously starting to be starting to be something something psycho, something psychological. One other example, a long film done, done around the same time, beginning middle of middle of 1970, a long film, a long film called Conversions. The film begins in darkness. There's a light moving around on the screen. Uh, after a few seconds, it's clear that this light is a candle that I'm moving around in front of my body. As I draw the candle, as I draw the candle near to my chest, the, the camera zooms in, and the rest of part one of the film is involved in my using the candle, using the light source of the film, to burn the hair off each breast. Then, once the hair is removed, pulling at each breast in a kind of futile attempt to develop, to develop, to develop, to develop a woman's breast. Uh, hence the name of the film, Conversions. Maybe two things to talk about with regard to this film. I might talk about this whole period of work in 1970 that sort of became, you know, sort of fit into the category of what became known as body pieces, whatever. Uh, probably the two obvious questions about the film are number one, there are easier ways to look like a woman. Number two, uh, number two, there are easier ways to get rid of hair. Uh, and I think, at least the way I answered those questions, I think had something to do with my intentions were with regard to the whole, I almost hate to call it body of work, but the whole, uh, the whole series of pieces at the time. Uh, with regard to the appearance of a woman, uh, it, uh, it seemed to me that the pieces were about the concentration towards something, the act towards something. Maybe I should talk a little bit about a kind of atmosphere that was around at the time. At the end of the 60s, uh, the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, I think it was important for a lot of people doing art to question the notion of the unique, the unique art, art object. So I think a lot of people are trying to find ways around, around the object. One way was to focus on the process towards something rather than the finalization of something. So probably I was tying myself into something that was in the air at the time when I was thinking about these pieces as concentration towards something, will towards something, the process towards something. In other words, I thought of the pieces almost like a kind of, almost almost as a kind of a little engine, little engine, little engine that could. You will your way towards something. You work towards something. Okay, so it seemed to me that if the film then, if the piece then ended in the transformation of me into the image of a woman, then the viewer's focus would be on this transformation act. The viewer's focus would be on this final result, this final image. If, on the other hand, uh, it was something that I couldn't do, if it was a futile attempt, no matter how much I pulled at my breast, it wasn't going to happen. 
I wasn't going to develop a, a, woman, a, wom a woman's breast. If then it was futile, then hopefully the viewer's focus would be not on the finished image, because that finished result never, never was reached. The viewer's focus would be instead on the act towards this, the concentration towards this. With regard to the burning, I think it has the same kind of, the same kind of concentration reason, uh, reasons. If I thought of the pieces as concentration, as acts of concentration, then I needed something, I needed something with which to guide that concentration, aid that concentration, channel that concentration, keep that concentration going. So if I use something, if I use something every day, like shaving, this would be something I would be so used to that there would be no reason to concentrate. If, on the other hand, I use something specialized, like fire, there would be a reason to concentrate, probably for the simple reason that if I didn't concentrate, I would burn. Therefore, therefore using something specialized would hopefully channel my mindset, channel my, channel my attention. Okay, so the second stage of peace then was if the first stage was sort of finding my way in a space, finding my way in a world, this stage of pieces was a kind of setting myself up as a point, making myself almost a kind, almost a kind of object. It seemed that what was sort of happening in these, in, the, in these pieces is that I was almost turning person into object to be viewed. If I, if I start an action that ends in me, if I make this circular movement, then I make this kind of closed circle around myself. I close myself into this, into the, into this circle. Okay, after having closed myself into that circle, then my obvious question was, where do I want a viewer to be? In a piece like this, a viewer is very outside. If I make a closed circle for myself, the viewer is a kind of, is a kind of, is a kind of, is a kind of wire. So it seemed to me that I wanted some way to bring other people, other people into my pieces. So starting at the beginning of 71, the pieces started to, evolve, to involve another agent beside, besides me. Uh, one, one quick example, uh, a long videotape called Association Area. Two people, each of us blindfolded, each of us with earplugs. Each of us, <clears throat> excuse me, each of us tries to imitate the other person, though obviously neither one of us can see or hear the other person. So in other words, an attempt to get, to get into almost a kind of quasi ESP state. Uh, again, connecting the language to the last stage of pieces, if that's I concentrate on me, this stage is something like I concentrate on him or her while he or she concentrates on me. Uh, uh, it seemed to me that if what was starting to bother me about pieces was the, the kind of closed circle aspect of them, it seemed that pieces like this didn't really change things. It made the circle bulge, but it didn't allow the viewer any way in. In other words, if I concentrate on another person while this person is concentrating on me, we're making ourselves a kind of couple. And as a couple, we sort of exclude, we sort of exclude everybody else. Uh, if I concentrate on this other person while this person concentrates on me, we make a kind of almost, almost magic circle, almost closed circle around ourselves. So if things like this were bothering me, it was obvious that what I wanted was some way that my, that viewer's space could coincide more with my, with my, with my space. And this started to happen in, uh, in, the, in the spring of 1971, uh, a piece done in an abandoned pier in downtown New York, uh, an abandoned closed pier, a closed warehouse pier. Uh, uh, the pier is very long, long distance from entrance on the street to the far end of the pier. The piece was done for a month every night. And the scheme of the piece was each night from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., I would be at the pier. I would be at the, at the far end of the pier. If anyone, if anyone wanted to come to the pier to meet me, I would attempt to reveal to that person something that hadn't been revealed about me before and something that could potentially be used against me. In other words, an attempt to give a viewer potential material, potential material for blackmail. I tell you something that I don't want to be revealed because revealing this can cause some kind of harm to me. So that you don't reveal it, you can demand something of me. So some kind of bargain is drawn up between me and you. So what that started for me, I guess, was a notion, 
a notion of art as an occasion of interchange, an occasion of meeting. Art as an occasion where person in the role of artist comes face to face with, meets person in the role, person in the role, in the role of viewer. Uh, one other example of this kind of piece, there's a slide or two missing here, so I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to describe it. It was a piece done uh, in the fall of 1971, a piece called Claim, a two-level space, street level and basement. Uh, on street level, as viewers entered, there's a video monitor next to the door that leads downstairs to the basement so that the video monitor acts as a kind of announcement to viewer, possibly a kind of warning to viewer. Seeing or hearing the thing uh, through the video monitor, viewer decides whether or not he or she wants to open the door, open the door, come downstairs. Uh, slide missing of the scene down, down, downstairs, but I'll describe it. The piece is a three hour piece. I'm seated on a chair at the foot of the stairs in the basement. I'm blindfolded and I have with me two lead pipes and a crowbar. And the piece then is involved with me talking, talking aloud, but talking directed to myself, saying things like, I'm alone here in the basement. I want to stay alone here in the basement. Uh, I don't want anybody to come down in the basement with me. I'll stop anybody from coming down in the basement with me. I'm alone here in the basement. I want to stay alone here in the basement. In other words, constantly using talk as a kind of, as a kind of, as a kind of, as a kind of, as a kind of hypnotism device, drumming this talk into me so that I become convinced that all that concerns me is the possession of this basement. This basement is mine. So that whenever I hear someone coming down the stairs, I swing in front of me with the lead pipe and crowbar, making this kind of fence around me, claiming this space, or as the title says, claim. Uh, and at that time, I guess I was thinking in terms of a, you know, of, of, of something like, you know, something like a kind of, uh, a kind of ultimate, uh, a kind of ultimate, ultimate sculpture. People always talk of sculpture taking space, claiming space. You can approach sculpture, but you can only go so far. So therefore, I was sort of turning into this claimant of space, into this, or almost sort of into this, into this space. One thing that was sort of happening around these pieces, around the time of these pieces that was probably that was probably important to work of mine was that uh, whereas most of the pieces in which I concentrated on myself were done as if there was no particular space if the film was if the piece was done on film it was always figure against a white ground against a black ground as if it was this figure in almost a kind of non-space space or if anything a kind of un a kind of universal space with these pieces, the surrounding space started to be important. Uh, that last piece that was done in the pier probably started with a kind of, uh, you know, 40s, mo 40s movie, at movie, at movie atmosphere. The notion of a pier as the kind of end of a city, end of a civilization, a place where you know rules don't rules don't count don't count anymore. So, in other words, the the atmosphere of a space, the feel of a surrounding, was starting to be was starting to be more and more important important in pieces. So, in these pieces, then I was sort of making myself into this kind of still point that a viewer that a viewer motion that a viewer moved towards. So I was sort of almost using voice as a kind of self-hypnotism that would fix me to a spot so that I would be this, I would be this point within an overall, an, an over, an over, an overall space. That notion of point started to disturb me in the sense that it seemed kind of significant that I was always still and the viewer was always moving. Uh, the viewer was always moving towards me. In other words, I was asking the viewer to walk across, walk through a pier where at night uh, it was difficult to notice if floorboards might be missing. I was asking the viewer to walk through crowbars and lead pipes in order to get to me. In other words, I was setting up an extra, a kind of extra grandiose position for myself. Uh, in other words, I had probably started think when I was starting doing these pieces, I was probably thinking of it in terms of meeting, a place where I meet you. I began to think it really wasn't a meeting of equals at all. I was really confirming a kind of art world hierarchy where artist is in a kind of higher position than viewer. So viewer is asked to viewer is asked to do something in order to get to a kind of elevated, you know, art position. So in other words, 
uh, I probably started to notice that work of mine was falling into what I thought disturbed me most about art. Art as a kind of religion, art as a kind of altar, artist as a kind of priest. Okay, so if, the, if notions like that disturbed me, it seemed to me that if I didn't want to be this point on a space, this point and therefore this kind of focal point, then there had to be a way where I wouldn't so easily be focused upon. So the obvious way it seemed to me was, well, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be seen. I had, to find a, I had to find a way where I wasn't seen in a space. So it seemed to me the obvious choices were, if I didn't want to be seen, I could be behind the wall, I could be above a ceiling, I could be under a floor. Behind the wall seemed off, since if I was behind the wall, I was no longer in the same room as viewers. I was in the, I was in the, the, ne the, next, the next room. Above the ceiling seemed wrong, since if I was above the ceiling, there was too much space between my position up there and viewer's position down here. Under the floor seemed, seemed, seemed possible, since under the floor I would, be, I would be in a position that was close to where, viewer, where viewers were walking. So thinking like that then led to a piece in the beginning of 1972, a piece called Seedbed, conventional gallery room about 45 feet by 25 feet, halfway across the room, the floor, <clears throat> The floor becomes a ramp that rises to a height of about two and a half feet, three feet at the, at the far wall. Uh, the piece is activated from opening time of the gallery to closing time, so from 10 in the morning till six each day. Uh, I'm underneath the ramp, moving around under the viewer's floor, under viewer's, viewer's footsteps. And my aim, is to, my aim is to constantly masturbate. And in order to do this, using the viewers as a kind of aid. Aid in the sense that I hear viewers' footsteps on top of me. I can use these footsteps as something on which to build sexual fantasies. I can build sexual fantasies on these footsteps. These sexual fantasies then can keep my activity, keep my, ma keep my masturbation going. This masturbation then can every once in a while reach climax. The viewer is in this position of thinking, oh, he did this for me, or he did, the, he did this with me, or whatever. So hopefully some attempt to join private space, private space under floor with public space, public exhibition space above floor. And I think that private public thing was something that obviously was important to me in work, in work at the beginning, probably something that's continued in different ways in different ways, in different ways up to now. Uh, I mean, one of the ways this piece started with, and I, uh, and I think my pieces have always had a tendency to do this, to sort of try to take off from, take off from some situation that existed. And at this time, in the beginning of the 70s, the kind of typical gallery space was starting to be a space that was probably influenced by minimal, by minimal art, the kind of clean white gallery space. The gallery space is a place with, uh, is a place with uh, white walls, uh, unpainted, unpainted wooden floor. So in this piece then, as the viewer enters the space, the viewer is enter entering the kind of typical, typical minimal art, clean white space, except in this case, there's a, kind of, there's, a kind of, there's a kind of worm under the floor. In other words, viewer enters this space, walks across floor and across ramp, Underneath the floor comes this voice, this voice saying something like, uh, I'm doing this with the person on my left, I'm touching your hair, I'm running my hand down your back, I'm touching your ass, whatever. So in other words, taking this kind of minimal art space and attempting to load it. The reason I mentioned that the, uh, the piece took place from, from opening time of the gallery to closing time wasn't so much to stress the endurance of the activity, but more, uh, more because it seemed to me that what was important in the piece was that uh, I was functioning as part of a space that a viewer was in. Therefore, this space, as far as any viewer knew it, had to, inclu had to include me. So in other words, it couldn't be the kind of thing where at a certain time in the day, I took, I took a kind of position here. Rather, this space always included me. This space always, inclu always included me, included me as part of it. So the movement of pieces then up to this point has been uh, 
in, in, the, in the beginning, me sort of finding some kind of place for myself, me turning myself into almost, me turning myself into almost the kind of space itself, the, uh, an, an, an object, a thing, me then becoming part of a surrounding, uh, my person becoming part of a surrounding, uh, part of a space, part of almost a kind of a kind of a, a kind of a, a kind of atmosphere. Okay. Uh, Throughout 1972, then, I guess because Seedbed raised basic questions for me. If I wasn't seen in a space, then why was I there? Uh, was it necessary for me, to, for me to be there? In other words, if I wasn't there in a space, if I was not seen, as in Seedbed, it was almost as if I was making this space a kind of, a kind of power field that extended from my presence underneath and that included viewers. In other words, the thing about Seedbed was that, and I'm not sure if I like this about the piece, but the thing about Seedbed was that any time a viewer came into that space, like it or not, the viewer became material for my mind. The viewer became material for my for my for my for my sexual for my for my sexual fantasy, and that notion of the viewer, the viewer sort of being immediately trapped into something is something that I think work of mine has always played with. But I guess I've always I've always rather had a position where the viewer had some kind of choice. Obviously, the viewer in Seedbed can leave, but as soon as the viewer comes in, that viewer is sort of entangled in this in this in this mental mental process okay so so through 72 then thinking in terms of maybe possibly not being not being part of a part of a piece uh, uh, after a few attempts of sort of trying to take myself out of pieces I, I I probably realized I wasn't quite ready for that. The pieces were about personness were about person to person relation so uh, there was this need to bring myself to still retain my still retain myself in pieces. One exam one piece that was probably the last example of of of, of live piece. Uh, one of the last examples of a piece that did use live presence was a piece done in the spring of 1973. A piece called a uh, piece called a piece called reception room. Uh, two rooms and a gallery. Uh, as you come in the gallery, there's this kind of entrance corridor, and the entrance corridor leads to the leads to the main room of the gallery. The entrance corridor includes a rug, a cushion on either end of the rug, and an audio and an, an audio tape. And the audio tape goes, "I should have been here to greet you, to invite you to sit down, sit opposite me. I should have been able to meet you face to face. I should have been able to talk to you, get closer to you." But I wouldn't have known what to say, what to do. I would have been afraid that you would find me disappointing, that I could offer no surprise. Maybe, maybe I should have fought my fear. We could have been comfortable here. We could have settled down on a rug, fallen back onto the pillows. We could have been alone here together. We should have been here, you and I, as if in a separate world. We could have been connected by the ground we sat on. I should have been able to move over to you. I should have been able to touch you. But instead, I've made myself believe that I'd be afraid to be near you, afraid to have direct contact with you. So I had to get away from you. I had to hide my face from you. It could have been like this. After a while, I could have pulled the rug toward me, and you would have come toward me with it into me. Or you would have pulled the rug toward you, and I would have come toward you with it into you. It could have been like this. After a while, we might have rolled toward each other, over each other, as if rolling over a rug. You might have fallen on me, or I might have fallen on you, as if on a pillow. But I can only talk in metaphor now. I can only talk about what could have been, because I've backed off, afraid to trust myself with you. I've backed away from you. I've had to, I've had to withdraw into another room. The entrance corridor then leads into the main room of the gallery. In the middle of the main room, there's a spotlight, a spotlight shining down on a table. Around the table are seven high stools. On top of the table, on top of the table is a mattress, so that the table has the look of uh, of a kind of examination table, a kind of operating table. Uh, I'm on top. I'm on top of the mattress, covered or partially covered by a, by a sheet. Viewers are on the stools or around the around the, around the stools. Uh, the activity of the piece is very simple: just constantly turning over from one side to another, so that turning over on one side. 
uh, one leg is exposed, turning over on the other side, my leg and my ass are exposed. And while this is constantly going on, from the bed, from the bed area, uh, uh, an, audio, an audio taped voice again, an audio taped voice saying, uh, there has to be something to say for myself, something that people call a reason to be. Being here can give me that reason something to say to them because they give me a reason to be here. I have to know they can see me. I have to know they can understand me. So I can act out what I dislike about myself in front of them. I can show what I'm ashamed of. They can see the pimples on my legs, the pimples on my ass. I mean this. I'm ashamed to get undressed. When there's someone here, when I'm going to bed with someone for the first time, I don't want it to see my skin, see the pimples. I want to hide it. I hesitate taking off my clothes. So people can walk by me now, they can look at me. Of course I realize that. In fact, I can come here just for that reason. I can come here just because they'll walk by, just because they'll stop and look. Maybe, maybe I have this in mind. Whoever, whoever I'll go to bed with here can see the skin now, she can see the pimples beforehand. But that isn't it, it doesn't matter whether or not I go to bed with anyone here. The pimples can be a fact now, it would be senseless to hide it in the future. So I can lie in the dark now, I don't have to see myself. They can see me instead, they can do the scene for me. They can examine me as if with a spotlight. A spotlight on what I can face up to about myself. Pimples on my legs, on my ass, the pimples point out faults in me. I'm unclean, I'm ugly, I can't grow up. Secrets, sexual sins, guilt, no, I can't talk about that now. So, so I keep turning myself over, I'm turning myself over to them. If, if they can see my skin and accept it, then maybe I can accept it too. I wouldn't have to want to get rid of it. I can't make myself talk about the rest of it. The fact that my feet smell, no matter what I do to them, I'm ashamed of that too. When I'm going to bed with someone for the first time, when I'm getting undressed, I have to show that too so I can be comfortable with it. Maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating my shame to give myself a reason to be here, a reason to be with other people here. So, so this could be a kind of strategy. I can't make myself talk to them, I can't meet them face to face, so I can turn myself into an object for them. It might be that I can reveal the flaws in my body because I'm afraid to reveal the flaws in my mind. Revealing what's private then can hide my withdrawal from public responsibility. I can conceal my lack of nerve, my refusal to interact with other people. Revealing parts of my body to be looked at like a corpse, dying, talking to myself here, thinking about myself. It's like a man reviewing his whole life quickly before he dies. Maybe, maybe this is a way to make myself die for myself, die to myself. I can be alive only as they see me. I remember now how Kathy watches me while I take a bath, how she breaks the pimples on my legs. It's as if she's preparing me for other women, preparing me to look beautiful for them, preparing me to go to bed with them. No, why am I bringing her into it? Maybe I'm not exposing myself at all. What I'm doing might be exposing her, harming her, under the pretense of exposing myself. I could say that it's too much to take. I can feel everything crashing down on me, a weight on my head. I can feel the ceiling falling in on me. It could be that what I'm showing will make up for what I can't make myself show. Maybe, maybe I'm not ashamed of my legs, my ass, pimples, smell of my feet. Maybe I'm not ashamed of those things at all. What I'm really ashamed of is the size of my prick, my certainty that it's too small, but I wouldn't show that. I want to avoid that. So, so I remember Kathy talking about my ass, how much she loves looking at my ass, touching my ass. I remember, I remember she said it's like a woman's ass. She likes that. At least I think she said that. I can't quite recall. Maybe, maybe the pimples can contradict that impression. They can, they can restore my masculinity, return me to manhood. I'm not sure now if I'm ever ashamed of the hair in my ass. But I remember Rosemary saying my prick was too small for her. I couldn't excite her. No, I can't get into that. If they think, if the people here think I'm exaggerating the pimples, then maybe they'll think, may, maybe they'll think I'm exaggerating that too. They might think, they might think I'm making too much of the pimples, I'm making them more important than they're worth, but that's just the point. If I think it's important and it's not, then I must be revealing to them what's really on my mind so they can't be upset that I won't respond to them. I'm giving them more than that. So show them my ass, fuck them, no. Uh, no, it's not, it's, not like, it's not like that. I can't believe that this is an act of aggression against them. But now and then I might want to believe that too. I might want them to accept that too. I want to test them. But it's really the opposite. I have to believe I'm leaving myself wide open, laying my cards on the table. Let's say, let's say I'm letting the cracks show. So, so they'll have to put the pieces together. 
So I'll keep going over this. I have to have something to say to myself, something to keep me here, something to stop me from running away. And the tape would, the tape would continue. Would continue over. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, maybe that applause sort of reveals something that was uh, that was starting to bother me about the pieces at this point. That the pieces were starting to turn into a, turn into a kind of theater. Uh, whereas the pieces up to now were all about a kind of being, uh, putting myself in a position where I was sort of on the spot, on the edge. Uh, in other words, um, putting myself at the at the foot at the foot of the stairs, uh, foot of the stairs with the blindfold, whatever. What happens? Uh, what interested me in a piece like that was what happens if somebody gets through the lead pipe and crowbar? Does this person now win? You know, does this person now take over this space? So in other words, what had interested me in pieces up until this time, and if anything ever interested me in the word quote performance, it was performance in the sense of in the sense of performing a contract, carrying a contract through, carrying a contract to a kind of completion. In other words, it was something like a kind of something like a kind of a kind of stand-up comedian. The lights go on, and now you have to do something. You have to, you have to perform. So what had been important about the pieces was that they were only done once. They, were, they, weren't, they weren't rehearsed. If they had been done more than once, that first time would have been a rehearsal for the, ne for the, ne for the next time. So that notion of uh, making an occasion in which you're on the spot so that you would have to react on the spot to whatever happened seemed to be the base of the pieces. By this time in 1973, something was changing. As soon as I had audio tape, it was now as if the audio tape was almost a kind of stage prompter. I had set myself up on a stage. It was significant in these pieces. The pieces started to use spotlight. Spotlight directed down on me, almost as if the viewer is this audience around the stage. There's this stage prompter voice, this audio tape. I'm going through the motions according to this stage prompter's voice. So in other words, it was kind of clear to me that maybe I didn't quite believe it anymore. Uh, that maybe something that was important to me uh, maybe there's something that was important to me in the beginning of my pieces, that notion of intimate space, that notion of a space where I meet you, was not so important anymore. In other words, it was a notion that probably came out of a kind of 60s framework, the, the notion of a kind of, the kind of 60s language of finding oneself, you know, as if the self is a kind of precious jewel that's sort of lost somewhere. You know? So you go into a kind of meditation chamber, meditation chamber-like space, closed space in order to find the self, examine the self, analyze the self. By 1973, 1974, I probably thought that that kind of space was possibly a kind of escapist space. In other words, if you set up a kind of intimate space where I meet you, then maybe there's this illusion that the faults are in us. And by saying that the faults are in us, it's a way of forgetting that, or a way of canceling out the idea that the flaw might be in something around. The fault might be in whatever political situation there is, whatever social situation, cultural, cultural situation. So in other words, by 73, 74, I wanted to make pieces be much more part of an overall cultural world, social world, political world. I didn't want them to be as isolated, as intimate, as private. In other words, I was probably, if you can make uh, overly simple distinctions, maybe until 73, 74, pieces were a kind of psychological self. After that, maybe a kind of sociological self, a kind of political self. I probably was starting to see psychology as a kind of escapism. Psychology as a way to say the fault is inside, internal, rather than the fault being in an overall system, overall, overall organization. Okay, so starting in 74 then, starting in 74, the pieces started to be non-live, not including me. The pieces started to be installations, installations using objects, audio tape, uh, just as that last piece was referring to a kind of theater-like space, the first installations were a very movie-like space. Just one quick example of a kind of a typical space of the 74, 75 pieces, a piece called Memory Box, a kind of wedge-shaped box 
with a curtain. If a viewer goes through the curtain, you enter this kind of movie space. You enter a space that, that has a, a, a kind of foam, foam bed in the middle and all these projections, slide projections coming from the head of the bed, going up on the ceiling and around the walls of this wedge space. Then another slide projection going, going towards, the, towards the bed. An audio tape voice coming from the head of the bed. Uh, I don't have the text with me, but very movie-like. Very movie something like, uh, something like uh, a kind of remembering tape, but always the remembering is always in terms of movie scenes. I remember it was the day, it was the day I, it was the, it was the day I was born. The, the soldiers were all very young and then going into a kind of war, typical war movie scene, or I remember going into a kind of movie western scene. So the, fir the, first, the first installations, probably because I was trying desperately to find a way to get rid of my own person in pieces, and, up, and I had obviously been so used to using my own persons, my, my, own, my own person, the pieces probably very logically turned to a kind of projection space because I wanted to probably project myself into other selves, project my own solo voice into other voices, multiple, multiple voices. Gradually, it became clear that Maybe the pieces didn't really have to do with person with person at all. Uh, so then I began to think if the pieces weren't about the instrument who did it, the instrument that did the piece, maybe they were about the ground that a piece was on. And by ground, I meant not so much physical ground or not just physical ground, but a kind of overall cultural ground. In other words, I began to think that a piece in New York should be different from a piece in Los Angeles, should be different from a piece in Milan, should be different from a piece in Cologne. In other words, instead of concentrating on, on my own person, the source of these pieces, why not concentrate on the audience they're meant for? What about orienting a space, uh, orienting a piece toward the audience that's, go that's, going to, that's going to receive it? Okay, so pieces like this started to clarify themselves in 1976 uh, uh, with, a piece called, with a piece called The American Gift. Uh, there were two versions of this piece. I want to describe both versions, though it's the same piece with different physical circumstances. The piece began as a piece for a large group show in Bordeaux in France. It consisted of a black box about five feet by five feet, about seven feet high. Around the top of the box, there's a slit uh, there's a blue light inside so that because of the slit around the top of the box, there's this blue glow around the box. The, it's, the, the, the piece was done for a relatively long space. So the black box is set up at one end of a space. Two or three rows of folding chairs are set up at the, at the, at the other end. Then there was another version of the piece where the piece got a, a room of its own, a kind of 12-foot cube room with its own ceiling uh, inside the overall, overall museum space. So because, the, because it was a room that was this kind of, temper, kind of transient looking room inside the overall space, the room had walls and a ceiling of its own, but it didn't have its own floor. It shared the floor with the overall space. I wanted to connect the piece with this room that it had, that it had for itself. So I inverted the box, hung the box from the ceiling. Uh, again, there's an opening around one end of the box, this time an opening around the bottom. Again, a blue light inside, so there's a blue glow, this time around the bottom of the box. And around the box and at the walls that surround the box, the walls of the room that surround the box are benches, seating areas. There's an audio tape, one audio speaker at the seats, another audio speaker inside the, inside the box. The piece starts off from the, uh, the kind of normal act of, tra act, of tra act of translation. This is a piece done by an American artist. It's in France. So it's using voice. In order for it to be understood, my American's words have to be translated. So the general structure of the piece is my voice 
my voice in English in a whisper, then a, man, a French man and woman's voice translating what I'm saying, but changing the person around. So that if I say you, the French man and woman say we. So to give you some idea what the sound is like, at the, at the seats, my voice in English in a whisper says, you are the, you are the, uh, you are the Europeans. French man and woman speaking French and speaking like a kind of learning exercise, like a kind of repetition exercise, say, we are the Europeans. My voice in English, uh, in a whisper, you wait and see. French man and woman's voice, we wait and see. My voice in English, you don't have to speak for yourselves. French man and woman, we don't have to speak for ourselves. My voice in English, you have America in the back of your minds. French man and woman, we have America in the back of our minds. Then at the box, my voice, uh, my voice speaking French, but very apparently an American's French, a very awkward French, saying something like, listen, listen, America speaks, America speaks. And then something like, la, 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 abacada. Then by the seats, my voice again, you learn the language. French man and woman's voice, we learn the language. La, 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 abacada, French accent this time. Then again at the box, my voice again speaking a kind of American's French, saying something like, something like, uh, quiet please, or step right up, or come and get it. One minute of America, one minute of America. And there might be one minute of Charles Ives music, or one minute of New Orleans jazz, or one minute of gunshots, one minute of a woman screaming, whatever. Okay, so uh, just to give you a quick idea of what the four line sections are, because it's always four lines, then the Listen America Speak stuff. Uh, you, are the, uh, you, are the, you are the Europeans, you look around, you see the light, you see America dropped in your midst. You are the Europeans, you see that America won't go away, you keep your distance, you go have a closer look. You are the Europeans, you waited for America to come home, you take America back, you take what you can get. You are the Europeans, you watch America off in the distance, you can't sit still, you have to keep up. You are the Europeans, you sit in front of the American wall, you feel left out, you want in. You are the Europeans, you taught America all we know, you want our respect in return, you want the money, and on and on with this exaggerated American exploitation talk. Okay. Uh, Maybe sort of significantly, just in terms of, in terms of the, the, the career of my stuff, uh, the, the first installation pieces in 74, 75, the pieces that involved projections, sort of focused on, focused, on a, focused on a kind of surrounding space. You walk into that space and you're surrounded by images by projections, probably maybe to, to clarify things for myself, to, to sort of almost set up some ground for myself, I probably started to switch from atmosphere to point within that, within that, within that atmosphere. So black box, center point, almost like the black monolith in you know, 2001, this black monolith that all these Europeans are sort of gathered around, or whatever. Um, OK. so. Um, what that started for me then was the notion of the notion of a piece oriented towards the towards the kind of community, the particular kind of group that's going that's going to receive it. Can we uh, can we switch to the next the next carousel, please? So in 76, 77 then, uh, the pieces started to have maybe uh, maybe two or three basic kinds of shapes, basic kinds of structures. One was a kind of meeting place structure, a kind of table and chair structure. In other words, I was starting to think of, I was starting to think in terms of an exhibition space as a place where people are going to gather anyway. Now that people are going to be here, can a piece be used as, as a way to gather a community together? a way to form a community. So the pieces started to be in the form of potential community gathering places. One example, a piece done in the fall of 1976, a piece called, a piece called Where We Are Now, parentheses, who are we, who are we anyway, close parentheses. It was a piece done at Sonnabend Gallery at 420, 420 West Broadway in New York. So it was in the kind of, uh, 
center of the center of the New York art, New York art, New York art world. And like that last piece, uh, where the piece was designed to be in Europe, in France, this piece was designed for a particular kind of space, a kind of art world, art world, and art world, art world, art world institution space. The piece uh, physically took off from the physical shape of the gallery. As you walk in Sanaben Gallery, as you as you get off the elevator, you go around an L-shaped corridor that leads you into what sort of serves as the main room of the gallery, central room of the gallery. So you have this L-shaped corridor that's almost a kind of non-space non space, a kind of tenuous space, and you have this very concentrated closed space. So uh, at this time, I guess I was trying, the way I was thinking of, the way I would think uh, about the shape of pieces was to, uh, to sort of almost uh, simply extend the, exist the existent space. So if the space, was con if the space uh, consisted of an open space and a closed space, I thought in terms of further closing the closed space, further opening the open space. So I blocked off the doorway of what's usually used as the central room of the gallery and painted the outside of the room black. Uh, it's that black mass at the right, at the right, at the right of the slide. So that the, the room becomes this large black object inside the overall space. Next to the black room then is a long wooden plank about, uh, about, 50, feet, about 50 feet long. The plank the plank settles itself in the gallery, has legs, stools on either side of the plank, so that the plank settles itself as a table. The table, uh, however, extends toward the window and out the window, so that what began as a table, what began as a table becomes a diving board, or what began as, a, as the means by which to settle in the gallery, settle inside the space, becomes, becomes the means by which to potentially leave the space, get out of the, get, get out of the gallery. Uh, again, again there's, an, there's an audio tape. The pieces from 76 to 79 all, inclu all include sound. Uh, just to give you some idea what the sound is like, there's a hanging speaker above the table. There's a constant clock ticking then voice comes in, and voice comes in under that first voice. So constant clock ticking, voice comes in. Now that we're all here together, and what do you think, Bob? Now that we've come back home, and what do you think, Jane? Now that we were here all the time, and what do you think, Bill? Now that we have nowhere else to go, and what do you think, Nancy? Now that we can take it, and what do you think, Joe? Now that we take it or leave it, and what do you think, Betsy? Now that we take what we can get, and what do you think, Dan? Now that we get what we deserve, and what do you think, Barbara? Now that we're satisfied, and what do you think, John? Now that we know we failed. Then another voice comes in, a kind of shouting voice says, rise, change places, rise. There's a quick burst of music, a quick burst of violin music, sort of like musical chairs. The music is cut short abruptly, abruptly by a voice saying, seats, seats, everybody, take your seats, take your seats. And as one voice is saying, take your seats, there's another muttering voice saying, but there's one left over. What do we do with that one? Where do we put that one? What do we do with that one? Where do we put that one? OK, so as this muttering voice is going on, in the black room, in the black room, there's this uh, crowd noise, as if this crowd is sort of bursting out of this black room and onto the table. But then always back to the constant clock ticking, always back to sentences like, now that we know, now that we know better, and always questions, and what do you think, Joan, and what do you think, Dennis, et cetera. OK, so the notion of uh, the was has this kind of quality. Sound has this quality of, some, of, of almost some kind of burden, some kind of pressure. And it was sort of clear to me that, well, obviously, I was using sound. I was using, if sound is that pressure, I obviously was using it in pieces because that's probably the way I was thinking of these pieces. I was thinking of these pieces as a piece would push a viewer up against the wall. 
with sort of the hoped for result that at some point, in other words, uh, uh, when I say push a viewer up against the wall, in other words, a voice sort of jabbing at a viewer with talk like, with talk like, with talk like you are the Europeans, you want the, you want the American money, whatever. With the hoped for result that at some point a viewer says, wait a minute, why am I being, why am I being pushed like this? What is this pressure that's pushing me like this? What is this, what is this system of oppression that this piece is a kind of example of? The question I always had with the pieces is, what happens with the viewer who doesn't get the joke? In other words, when does a piece become an analysis of oppression, and when does a piece become a kind of further instrument of that oppression? And it's something I don't think the pieces ever really, ever, ever really resolved. I doubt if they really could resolve it. Um, Okay, so if there was that kind of pressure, if the pieces did consist of this pressure that was pushing the viewer up against the wall, it seemed like they had to provide a chance for a viewer to, to react against that pressure, a viewer to sort of fight back, a viewer to do something. So in, 19, in around 1978, uh, the shape of the pieces, whereas the pieces in 76, 77 were table, passageway, wall, the pieces in 78 started to be in the form of maybe a kind of quasi-machine, something that, something that uh, wraps up an exhibition area, something that ties up an exhibition area, so that at some point it can be untied. At some point it can be untied by a viewer, sort of released by a viewer. Uh, one example, uh, an installation with video in February 1978 a piece, call, a piece called VD Lives, TV Must Die. Uh, it was done for a space that had five columns, five columns in the, mid, in the, middle, in the middle of the space. Uh, the columns became used as the supports for two large slingshots, two giant rubber bands. Uh, in other words, three, each set of three columns becomes the support for this rubber band that goes from column A around column B to column C, and then holds in place, holds in place a ball, a ball that's directed towards a television set. So that if, if the hook is released, rubber band springs, ball zooms, to zooms towards, tele towards television set. One of the rubber bands uh, has its plot complicated a little bit in the sense that there's another rubber band that comes from the top of the window around the, around the ball down to the bottom of the window. So that if released in one direction, the rubber band springs the ball towards the television set, released in the other direction, ball zooms towards window, through window, into street. Uh, okay, uh, two monitors. Uh, uh, there's a... Uh, one, uh, one monitor is basically silent and basically a still image. Uh, an image that's a kind of conglomeration of body parts, a uh, kind of large grouping of vaginas and penises, almost as if the video, the video monitor is this box stuffed with vaginas and penises. Uh, so the vaginas and penises are still, for say a minute, minute and a half, they start to shift a little bit as voice comes in. Voice comes in as if it's directing aim, though it starts to be a little more loaded than that. So vaginas and penises still start to shift. Voice comes in there, right there. No, there, there, no, you missed it. There, that's better, that's good. Oh, that's so good, oh, that's so good. Now aim in, now you're almost like him. Vaginas and penises still again start to move a minute and a half later as voice comes in over, move over, right to the right. No, you're right, right, oh, right, oh, that's right, oh, that's so right, oh, that's so right. Now get a beat on it. Now he's almost like me, or I'm almost like him, or he's almost like her. The other monitor is uh, basically a gray screen. There's constant sound. There's sound of gunshots. 
that every 20 seconds or so leads to voice, that every now and then leads to a quick image on the screen. Uh, on the screen. Quick flash of prick, quick flash of cunt. So to give you some idea of that monitor, gunshots, 20 seconds, voice comes in. You don't want a cunt that looks like that. He don't want a cunt that looks like that. She don't want a cunt that looks like that. We don't want a cunt that looks like that. They don't want a cunt that looks like that. Another voice sort of stands out. I don't want my cunt. Another voice comes in and says, freeze. And then a multiple voice says, I'll take your picture with my brownie. And as voice says, I'll take your, as voice says, I'll take your picture with my brownie, there's a quick flash of cunt on the screen. Cunt fades out as voice says, zap, you are sterile. Gunshots come in again, gunshots 20 seconds. Voice comes in, what a sight, what a sight, what a sight. Another voice, freeze, multiple voice again, look at the birdie. As voice says, look at the birdie, quick flash of prick on the screen. Prick fades out, voice, zap, you are sterile. Gunshots 20 seconds, voice comes in, a kind of chanting voice says, China, 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 Russia, 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 Cuba, 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 Cuba. Gunshots again, 20 seconds, kind of echo voice comes in, help me, I can't control myself. Stop me before I rape more. Freeze, I'll take your picture with my brownie. Flash of cunt, cunt fades out. Zap, you're sterile. Gunshots, 20 seconds, voice comes in, China, 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 China. Russia, 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 Cuba, 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 Cuba. Gunshots again, 20 seconds, voice comes in. She don't want a prick that looks like that. He don't want a prick that looks like that. You don't want a prick that looks like that. They don't want a prick that looks like that. We don't want a prick that looks like that. Another voice, I don't want my prick. Another voice, freeze, multiple voice, look at the birdie, flash of prick, prick fades out, uh, kind of echo voice, zap, you're sterile. Gunshots, 20 seconds, voice comes in. A kind of high voice says, kill me, kill me. And as a high voice is saying, kill me, kill me. Another voice under that says, kill me, kiss me, thrill me, miss me. Uh, another voice says, will I? Uh, will I? Will you? Uh, voice, freeze, multiple voice, I'll take your picture with my brownie. Uh, uh, flash of cunt, zap your sterile, gunshots 20 seconds, voice comes in, I'll remember you, I'll remember you, I'll remember you. Freeze, look at the birdie. Uh, mostly variants of what's come before, a lot of China, 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 Russia, Russia, Russia. Variants like, uh, variants or combinations like, uh, uh, we don't want a prick that looks like that. She don't want a cunt that looks like that. You don't want a prick that looks like that. They don't want a cunt that looks like that. He don't want a prick that looks like that. Another voice, I don't want my body. So variants of what's come before, gradually, gradually leading up to a kind of story. Gunshots, voice comes in, voice comes in. So I got the sif, and now I give you the sif. And now you go back home, and you give it to your husband and your husband gives it to your sister, and your sister gives it to your brother, and your brother gives it to the maid, and the maid gives it to the milkman, and the milkman gives it to your daughter, and your daughter gives it to your son, and your son gives it to my daughter, and my daughter gives it to my son, and my son gives it to my wife, and my wife gives it to the dog, and the dog gives it to the, and the dog, and the dog, and the dog gives it to the cat, and I hate that fucking cat. And back to, back to gunshots, whatever. Uh, okay, so one, one, one thing that was, one thing that was sort of changing in pieces was that whereas up until this point the pieces were pretty much uh, were pretty much oriented towards a particular cultural space a piece for France a piece for the Whitney Museum a piece for a piece for a kind of art for a piece, a piece for a kind of art institution. By this point, something was changing. This piece was done in New York, but aside from the language, aside from the fact that it was in English, it really didn't have to be in New York. In other words, uh, it seems as if rather than a piece being about a kind of cultural space, it was starting to be about a kind of cultural medium, a, 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 about a kind of cultural media that could be sort of transferred from space to space. So something was changing in the sense that I was probably starting to, probably starting to have a lot of questions about the specificity of a place that a piece was designed for. In other words, up until this point, it was kind of important that a piece, uh, it was kind of important that a piece only started once a particular occasion was given. So a piece was always site-specific. In other words, this piece would 
probably never have happened if it wasn't for the fact that I was given a space that had these columns in the middle, so I had to think in terms of what do I do with these columns? Uh, columns become something to sort of wrap up. Uh, uh, I liked the notion of site-specific work because what that meant was it possibly produced the, it probably pro it possibly produced the, an art that made no kind of claims made no kind of claim at universality, but rather recognized the fact that it meant something for this particular place at this particular time. At the same time, I started to have second thoughts about it in the sense that if I'm always doing something that's site-specific, then I'm constantly adjusting. I'm constantly adapting. I'm constantly adapting to that space. Since the spaces I'm doing things for are always institutionally controlled spaces, the question then is, what exactly am I adapting to? What exactly am I adjusting to? So I started thinking more in terms of a kind of portability, rather than, rather than a piece coming out of a particular space, I began to think more in terms of a piece going to a space, or more a piece going from one space to another. Uh, and this was something, I guess, that I had thought up until that point, that work of mine was, was totally against, the notion of a kind of studio art the notion of artists doing something in his studio or her studio, then bringing it elsewhere so that it can be displayed, so that it can be exhibited. So that notion of studio art was still sort of problematic to me, yet it was obvious that I was starting to do something that was like that. So I probably had to sort of talk myself into a kind of position. In other words, if I used, if I used, if I said of myself, I have now become a kind of studio artist, I probably would start to feel very, very shaky. If I change the language around, in other words, instead of saying artist, does, artist makes a work in his or her studio, then takes it elsewhere in order to exhibit, if I change the language a bit into something like, into something like uh, a guerrilla fighter makes a bomb in his or her basement and then takes it elsewhere into a public space, in order to exhibit it, in order to set it off, then maybe I could start to feel sure of myself as I'm working. Okay, so pieces started to, pieces started to, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, from here these slides are got to focus, I'm not sure if they are or not, but uh, are they? I'm not sure if I can fix it from here. Is that better? Uh, okay, so, Pieces then started to have a kind of portability. Pieces started to be thought of by me as a kind of vehicle that goes from place to place. Uh, one example, a piece done in, in the summer of 79, a piece called, a piece called The People Mobile, uh, that consisted of a flatbed truck that went to five cities in Holland. In each city, it sets itself up in a central town square in the city. Uh, it sets itself up in the town square for four, three, four, three days. Each day, the, the flatbed of the truck becomes the support for a different construction that's made of the steel panels that were on, that were on, that were on the truck. As the flatbed of the truck is used as a support for, this, for these for these variable constructions, the cab of the truck has a use in that it, gain, it sort of gains a face. It's covered with a black plastic cover that has a kind of pumpkin-like cutout. So that, for example, on the first day, the truck becomes a support for a set of steps that lead up to, lead up to a wall. The second day, the truck becomes a support for a set of corridors and or shelters. The third day, the truck becomes a support for a kind of table and chair, table and bench area. Uh, on top of the cab of the truck is a public address system speaker. Uh, there are constant, constant sound, constant car horns, so that the sound of the piece is like the space around, around the town square. There are obviously cars in the street, in this town square, there's more sound of, car, sound of cars. Uh, so there are constant car horns. Every once in a while, the car horns get lower and voice comes in. So car horns, uh, voice comes in, ladies and gentlemen. 
Is there a terrorist in the crowd? Car horns get louder again, and voice comes in. Ladies and gentlemen, I have come for your terrorists. Bring me your terrorists. Watch me. I can look at your terrorists straight in the eye. Car horns loud again. Then text changes according to particular construction. Uh, for example, on the first day when the construction is a wall, the voice is something like, welcome, welcome, welcome terrorists, presenting a target for terrorists. I promise you, this time we're ready for you. Bang your heads against our wall. Or the second day, with the kind of corridor shelter, welcome, welcome, welcome terrorists, presenting shelter for terrorists. I promise you, every terrorist will have a home here. So going from that kind of talk to, pardon me now while I speak to the normal people, ladies and gentlemen, presenting terrorism for everybody, terrorism without blood, terrorism with no consequences. So always back and forth to that talk to terrorists, talk to normal people. Okay, so what the piece started then, what the piece started for me then was the notion of a piece as very literally, very literally a vehicle. Uh, if, anything, if anything was potentially bothering me about a piece like that, uh, it was that wherever it went, the piece went to five cities in Holland, wherever it went, it took the same space with it. So the space was always unchanged. The space was always fixed. So the piece was portable, but the space wasn't. In other words, the piece would go from place to place, but it would always impose the same space uh, on, onto, onto wherever, wherever it went. So I began, to think, uh, I began to think slightly differently that could a piece, can we get, can we get to the next, uh, next tray, please? Can a piece, instead of consisting of a finalized space, can a piece consist of only a kind of potential space? Could a piece consist of a potential space that would have to be actuated by viewer? Uh, a space that wouldn't be completely there until a viewer, until a viewer activated it. So this started to be clarified in the beginning of 1980. Uh, beginning of 1980 with a piece called, with a piece called Instant House. Uh, Four panels on the floor, four American flag panels, eventually used as walls, a swing in the middle. If a viewer, if a viewer sits on the swing, the swing goes down and these walls rise up around the viewer, making, making a kind of American flag house inside, Russian flag house outside. So, so what that started for me then was, I guess, the kind of piece that's pretty much been the kind of thing I've been doing lately, though there have been, there have been, there have been some changes. Uh, basically, the, the structure is a piece, a piece that consists of an instrument like a swing, a vehicle like a bicycle. Uh, this instrument or swing, this instrument or vehicle would be used by a viewer. Using this instrument or vehicle then makes a shelter, makes an architecture. This architecture then carries a sign, carries some kind of, pro carries some kind of propaganda. Uh, this propaganda then only lasts as long as a viewer keeps the thing going. In other words, as soon as a viewer gets up off the swing, the walls fall back down to their, to their, to their original, original, original position. So it's up to the viewer to keep the to keep the, keep the shelter in existence, up to the viewer to keep the signs of a particular culture in existence. The, the, the first group of these pieces, starting in 1980, were, were pretty much, uh, though I'm not sure if I realized this at the beginning, were pretty much for the use of one person and almost the observance of another. In other words, it sort of divided people into participants and observers. In other words, if there was only one person who went into this space, went into the exhibition area, there were no other people around, and this one person sat in the swing, 
the person probably the person wouldn't be aware of the outside of the house. The person would only be aware of the private space, the secure space, the American flag house. You would need another observer. You would need a, you would need another viewer to know the public side, the monument side, the outside the outside of the house. Okay, maybe uh, some of these I probably should skip through, but to give uh, some some examples, a piece called a piece called Mobile Home. Uh, on one end of a space, a stack of houses, uh, one house stacked, stacked inside the other, and about 40 or 50 feet away from it, a kind of receiver house, a house that faces, faces the stack. Inside the stack of houses is a bicycle that's connected by a clothesline on which hang re uh, nine or 10 red shirts. Um, if a viewer gets on the bicycle, rides the bicycle, the viewer pulls out one house after another from the stack, uh, gradually, uh, gradually sort of enclosing himself or herself in this kind of mausoleum of houses, in this kind of, in this kind of tomb of houses. This is, I guess, probably the only piece in the last two years of pieces that has retained the use of sound. Each of the stacked houses has a speaker, an audio, an audio speaker. Each speaker has one phrase of the Star Spangled Banner, uh, instrumental version, so that when the houses are stacked, there's this noise. When a person then starts to ride the house out, one phrase of the Star Spangled Banner starts to separate itself. So if the rider of the bicycle then encloses himself or herself in this kind of tomb, on the outside, a person can walk past one phrase of the Star Spangled Banner, then to the next phrase, next phrase, next phrase. Uh, Okay, um, again, maybe, maybe there are just too many pieces to focus on each one of them. Um, but all of these pieces moved by viewers, used by, used by viewers. A uh, piece done in, around, in, spring, in spring of 1980, a piece called High Rise. Uh, a stack of panels about six feet square, about 45 feet away from it, uh, a little black cart. If a person gets in the cart and pulls himself or herself and the cart towards the panels, the panels start to rise into what becomes eventually a 25-foot high, four-story building, each, each story having this kind of window, window and doors, and the other side having this 25-foot red spray-painted graffiti penis so that you sort of become a little child again and get in this cart and raise this 25-foot male sex sign. Then if you get out of the cart, if you get out of the cart, the penis then dwindles to dust. Yeah. The penis goes back down, goes back down to nothing. Uh, the way the piece worked, and it, I, I guess it was sort of hopefully the way I thought, uh, the way I was thinking that the whole group of pieces would, would work, uh, the, uh, this piece in particular was sort of like, uh, it was sort of like the test your strength game at a carnival, uh, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that just about everybody could raise the building two stories. It was a little harder to raise it to the third story, or a little more effort, a little more will to raise it to the fourth story. So, if a person is using this cart, then you raise the thing, to, you raise the thing two stories high. By this time, you probably feel, you probably feel, probably feel a little foolish. However, by this time now, other people are around. So if the viewer, especially if the viewer is a male, does now the viewer feel sort of obligated to you know, raise, it, raise it four stories high or whatever. So I guess the way I've thought of these pieces was that, uh, okay, the, piece, the, the, viewer becomes, the viewer becomes almost some kind of puppet, which I have funny feelings about, but the viewer becomes a kind of puppet or victim of a kind of cultural sign of a, of, the propaganda of the culture he or she is in. But it's up to the viewer to decide whether or not to keep that propaganda going, keep that sign going. Okay, um, well again, there are probably too many of these pieces, too many of these pieces to talk about. But uh, one piece done the summer of, summer of 19, uh, summer of 1980, like, well all the pieces have an unactivated state and an activated state. This piece was done in a small, in a little a small city in Italy, in Spoleto. Unfortunately, the Italians sent me only the activated state, but uh, uh, the unactivated state is, you know, equally as important. 
Uh, it's a piece called Gang Bang. Um, and it's a, piece, uh, it's a piece designed to be done for a month. It's a piece designed for 10 cars, that, 10 cars that belong to people you know, in this city. Uh, so that over the period of a month, the cars would be used as you would uh, uh, in a kind of ordinary day, uh, go to work, come home, uh, visit friends, whatever. Uh, the 10 cars are each installed with roof, with roof racks so that when the cars are parked, it's sort of as if you're on a kind of camp, as if you're going on a camping trip. There's this roof rack uh, with fabric inside. When the car moves, however, because of a little wind scoop at the front of the at the front of the roof rack, the fabric becomes this inflatable, uh, so that nine of the cars, nine of the cars each have a nine-foot inflatable penis made of army camouflage fabric, and one car has a pink parachute. Uh, has an inflatable pink parachute breast, so that during the course of the month, uh, one penis might one penis might uh, cross another penis at an intersection, or uh, 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 nine penises might chase one helpless breast, or breast turns around and chases penis, or whatever. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So the the first group of pieces then probably were involved with a kind of uh, uh, act of sort of building, building something, almost from nothing then building something, building something, building something up. Uh, panels on the floor, panels rise. Uh, the next step of pieces was probably more like an already existent structure, an already existent structure that could be broken, that could be broken, that could be unloosed, that could be uh, that could be peeled, uh, whereas the first group of pieces were pretty much for the use of one person to be seen by others. The pieces started to change in 1981 so that they were used by a kind of group of viewers, a kind of community of viewers. One example, uh, a piece done in the spring of 1981 called Community House, a long kind of gallery house, galleria, uh, made of green fiberglass, about 90 feet long by about five feet wide. The house is totally enclosed so that there's no entrance possible inside. Around the house, around the house are these roadways, uh, uh, black rubber mats with these white lines. On each rubber mat, on each rubber mat is a bicycle. There are six bicycles in all. Each bicycle, each bicycle handles or controls one section of the house. So that if a person gets on a bicycle, part of the house, part of the house starts to bulge. Person gets on the bicycle and part of the house bulges away from the central core. So that if a person gets on the bicycle at either end of the house, riding the bicycle then makes the house bulge at the end of the house, so now the house becomes usable. So in other words, if some people in the community become bicycle riders, other people in the community potentially become house users. So people, people ride bicycle, other people can now go into the central hallway and in turn into each room that goes off the central hallway. Each room has a doorway. Each room has a doorway that's a, that's a cut out conventional sign. There might be a cross, there might be an X, there might be a swastika, a person shape, a bird shape. Okay, just as in order to use the house, one person in the community needed other people in the community to make that house usable, when a person is in the house, a person depends on the, on the people outside to keep riding the bicycle. In other words, a person can be in the house and a person outside now decides to get off the bicycle so that the person inside the house is trapped, so that the person inside the house becomes this kind of figure inside a fishbowl. So some kind of community agreement is necessary. Uh, some people become bicycle riders, some people house users, whatever. Okay, starting at this time then, in, uh, in 81, the pieces were all, uh, all seemed to have to do with a group of, a group of a group of users working working together. Maybe one or two other examples. A piece called Exploding House, a kind of almost composite of house types, uh, 
brown clobbered house, columns. There are these kinds of almost super graphic like arrows on the floor, bicycles on the arrows. Um, each arrow, uh, each bicycle makes one, one section of the house explode so that if all the bicycles are used, the entire house starts to, starts to fall away or explode. Uh, uh, each section of the house, can we go to the last tray? Each section of the house has as its, uh, as its wooden structure these kinds of robot-like statues uh, that sort of support, support each, section, each section of the house. Okay, so uh, most of 81 and, and, re and recently, the notion of a group of people, a group of people using, using a space together. Maybe just one, one other example. Uh, a piece called, piece called Peeling House, kind of conventional hut shape. Um, uh, it's covered with uh, pla uh, plastic, yellow plastic raincoat fabric. And the front of it has a kind of almost neckline like front. There's a ring hanging in front of the neckline. If a viewer pulls the ring, the, uh, the first layer of the house rises so that now the house is covered with, now the house is covered with camouflage fabric. So if a person keeps pulling the ring, another person can go over to the next, the next side of the house, pull another ring, now camouflage rises, and you get to the third layer of the house, which is the snakeskin fabric. First two viewers keep pulling the ring, another viewer goes over to the third side of the house, pulls that ring, snakeskin rises, get to this kind of pink disco-like fabric. Uh, first, three, first three viewers use the ring, La uh, fourth viewer comes, pulls the last ring, again with the kind of neckline, pulls the last ring, raises the, ha uh, raises the last layer of the house, and gets to the support of the house that's this furniture-like swastika shape uh, that sort of keeps the whole house and its decoration in place. So you pull, the you, you pull all the layers of decoration and you get to this kind of furniture-like, everyday-like swastika in the, middle, in the middle of it all. On the inside of these columns are uh, almost ghost-like figures that, uh, that are painted on the inside of the columns looking in onto this, onto this swastika. Uh, again, there are probably too many pieces to talk about. This is a piece called a piece called a piece called a piece called Collision House. These two wedge shapes. Uh, if a person, uh, one wedge shape has a bicycle inside. If a person gets inside the wedge shape from the back, goes on the bicycle. Uh, the wedge shape goes into the into the second wedge shape, pulls out a sec a middle section from that wedge shape wedge shape that the viewer is riding in becomes caught, wedged, inside the two ends of that original wedge shape. Uh, uh, in the wedge shape that you're riding, there are these two holes like windows. You look on either side, and there are these two, these two uh, triangular shaped buildings. One inside, one ha each has a kind of seat inside, and on the wall behind, these initials, BMB period, SHLTR period, NO period one, the other one, same thing, NO period two. Pulling out from the wedge shape is this kind of pavilion temple-like thing with this hanging black flag with cut, out, with cut out letters that say NGGR period, FLG period, NO period, one period and the size of the house have this kinds of cloud, uh, blue sky cloud. Uh, okay, maybe up to more recent pieces. A piece done this past December, a piece called Fan City. Uh, a, central, a central aluminum pole. Uh, in a cross shape around the pole are these four fin structures or each fin structure is a kind of set of fin-like shapes. Uh, each set of fin shapes encloses or sandwiches these aluminum poles that eventually have a use as a tent framework. Each set of fin shapes has one extending out from the other so that it can be potentially used as a kind of handle. At the central pole, there are two 
uh, two cut-out figures, human-like, bisecting each other and in turn bisecting the pole. Okay, those handles then. If a person uses a handle uh, and sort of walks out this fin shape, a person makes a quarter circle of tent frames, tent structures. As you pull out a quarter circle of tent frames, one half of one of those central figures rises up the pole, almost like hanging somebody or raising a king, whatever. As this human shape rises up the pole, the bottom part of the body is fish-like or bomb-like. Okay, if four people use the handles, you can make a whole circle of a whole circle of tent frameworks, and in turn, then all the figures in the middle rise up the pro rise up rise up the pole. Okay, once the tent frameworks are are let out, then and a person keeps using the handle, other people then can come along, and pulling a ring at the front of each tent structure, you make the sides of the tent by pulling a ring you pull out shades from shade rollers at the front of the tent, and the sides of the tent are in the form of almost large, of sort of large college football-like banners. But these college football banners, rather than saying uh, UCLA or Notre Dame, whatever, sort of categorize people who might be sort of in this city. In other words, one quarter, one quarter circle might, uh, would, would read if each, tent, if each tent is pulled out, each tent side is, pull, is pulled out in kind of college football blues might read gays, punks, nymphos. The next quarter might read beggars, cripples, old folks. The next quarter, uh, blacks, aliens, pinkos. The next quarter, uh, junkies, schizos, freaks. So in other words, if this were a world controlled by a kind of moral majority, this would be a kind of city of undesirables. Or maybe this would be the city where the undesirables would gather in order to sort of you know, gain some force or whatever. Uh, OK, um, well, a kind, of, a kind of subsidiary piece. But it was a piece done for a, it was a, piece done for a, man, for a manifesto show. So it was specifically done as a kind of manifesto, a piece called, a piece called, three, a piece called Three Manifestos, three window-like structures, uh, one with this kind of cloud background, one with a mirror, one with, one with Reagan. Each of them, each of them have shades. Uh, uh, well, you know, the, the, the shades just sort of, just sort of probably tell what I've been trying to say for the last hour and a half. But uh, when one shade is pulled down, it reads, and art should and art should last only so long as people as pe as people keep it up. In front of the mirror, then, when the shade is pulled down, there's a kind of there's a there's a uh, a, a bomb explosion photograph, on top of which the thing reads, and art should last longer than people can hold it down, and on top of the Reagan. Uh, and you see, Reagan, you see through to the Reagan thing. And art should last only as long as people, as pe only as long as people see through it. Okay, so it's maybe one or two recent pieces. Um, piece done this past February called "The City That Comes Down from the Sky." Uh, at the seal, at the ceiling of a space, these three aluminum structures, sort of like flying creatures, almost like, uh, almost like butterflies. Uh, there's, there's not a close-up of each of these structures, but I maybe to sort of describe it. Uh, each aluminum structure is composed of a kind of rectangle, uh, rectangle box aluminum tube body. Each body then has a kind of pyramid-like tail and a sphere head, and each of them has a wi has a has a wingspan. Uh, underneath each butterfly is a swing. If if the swings on either end are used, the two end butterflies come towards the center, and as they come towards the center, the wings come down, making this kind of uh, tent-like shape or pitched roof-like shape. So that if all the swings are used, there's this grouping of, of tent-like structures. If people stay in the swings, then other people can come along and pulling on, on, on rings that now become available now that the wings are down, you pull up these large shades, 
uh, with a sky, cloud, and various hand, hand gestures, almost as if the city comes down from the sky and now you raise something back up. Uh, whereas the, the two end, the two end uh, structures have these black hands, the middle structure has red hands that start to be used as, as masks, faces, whatever, so that if all the things are used, all the hands up, whatever. Okay, maybe, uh, well, let's quickly go through this piece. Uh, a, piece called, a piece called Portable City, uh, a stack of pyramids uh, was done for a college campus so that the stack of pyramids could be, could be carried to different points on campus each day. When the pyramids are carried to uh, each spot, uh, one pyramid is lifted off the other so that there are these three pyramids. Uh, if four people lift the pyramid and sort of uh, use it as a roof, act as the living columns of this house, another person can come along and pull down the, uh, pulling on a ring, you make these kinds of sides of a house around you. And the sides of a house are, the, are sort of face-like. One side has a, has a kind of mouth-like, mouth-like door. Another side, eye-like, uh, eye-like opening. Uh, one, one house is, uh, one house is white and black, ripstop nylon, with kind of, uh, uh, so that it almost looks like a kind of, Face, de face decoration, second house is animal skin, third house is kind of uh, silver gold-like fabric. Each of the houses has, uh, each of the houses has a, a conventional sign sort of snuck in. Uh, on that first house, uh, where there's a kind of eye makeup, there's a kind of birthmark, that's a, that's a uh, that's a that's a that's a star of David. On the second house, the uh, leopard skin has a kind of brand on a far on a forehead. That's a swastika. The third house has an eyeball. That's a hammer and hammer hammer and sickle. Uh, okay, a piece done this past summer called Umbrella House Prototype for Prototype for an Umbrella City. Uh, a closed umbrella about 18 feet high. Uh, by using a crank, the umbrella is opened like a normal, normal, um, normal umbrella. The umbrella is composed of, uh, the umbrella is made of uh, camouflage fabric on top of which is a, on top of which is a Coca, -Co is a Coca Cola logo. So if a person keeps his or her hand on the crank so that this umbrella roof keeps standing, other people can come along, and pulling on rings, you raise this wedge-shaped triangular house around you. Each house has, has uh, three sides. Uh, one side of each house is a flag. There's an Argentine flag for one house, a Polish flag for the, for the second, an Irish flag for the third. One side is a kind of conventional public sign, like a kind of toilet sign, though in this case the male might have an arm missing, or the female might have her head sort of blown off to the side. The baby is sort of floating on a kind of diagonal. Uh, the, third, the, third side, the third side is, a, is black fabric and with a doorway cut out in the shape of a penis or bomb out of which come these yellow spurts that are sort of that are like the yellow of the Coca-Cola above, almost as if Coca-Cola makes this universal urine throughout the world. Or whatever. Um, okay, so if all viewers use it, then you have this uh, you have this group of three houses. Um, okay, what what I guess had been bothering me in a lot of ways about the pieces, and this was a very recent piece this summer. Uh, is that, okay, the pieces announce themselves as house, announce themselves as city, but it seems like they're sort of fakes in the sense that they become nothing other than sort of, than sort of lar large scale models. In other words, they call themselves house, they call themselves city, but where's the stove, where's the refrigerator? In other words, they almost just seem like, they just seem like demonstrations of something. Uh, so maybe lately something else is starting to happen uh, in that the pieces, rather than building a kind of house or city of its own, 
seems to be sort of more willing to tie into an already existent an already existent architecture so that it becomes it becomes part of something that's already there uh, one example is this recent piece is this recent piece called room dividers uh, done for a space about 50 feet by 50 feet with four columns in the middle uh, so within those four columns then there's this enclosure so that uh, at the first stage of the piece though this might be a stage that is never returned to in the piece uh, since very since different from the other pieces here the piece doesn't retract into its original position retract back into its original position so in its first stage there's this enclosure in the middle a person a person might come into the space then uh, might want to get into this enclosure or whatever uh, the walls act as sort of sliding doors so you can slide one wall one wall out out to one side of the central enclosure. However, if you slide one wall out, there's still another wall there. So you might slide the other wall out. So now you've made a kind of other enclosure. You've broken this enclosure in the middle, but now you go into this, now you go into this uh, U-shaped like enclosure. In order to change that then, you might pull another wall aside. In other words, everywhere you slide a door, you're making other sets of enclosures, other sets of enclosures inside the room. Uh, the surface of the room, uh, it's, uh, it's aluminum, corrugated aluminum, painted uh, every, every alternate stripe, and painted sort of landscape-like. The first set might be uh, camouflage-like, then sort of blue sky-like. Uh, just as the piece, just as the walls physically divide a room, I sort of want them to be kinds of rooms that would cause sort of divisions among the people, possible divisions among the people in the room, so that coming out of these kinds of landscape-like walls are fragments of words, and they're always sort of lo loaded words. One wall might read welfare, the next wall abortion, inflation, whatever. Um, Okay, uh, that's I guess the most the most uh, recent piece. I'm not sure exactly how I want to try to sum up. I mean, obviously the stuff is uh, the stuff, especially in the last few years, has taken from or stolen from architecture, whatever. Uh, one thing that's obviously interested me in architecture is this is something that's potentially that architecture provides something that's usable, something that a person can be in. Probably just as much as that, though, what's interested me in taking from architecture is that architecture provides, provides a set of accessible conventions, provides a set of conventions that's very available to everyone, a door, a roof, a window, whatever. So it provides a set of conventions that could be immediately and very easily read so that then maybe something else can start from those, uh, from those immediately grasp graspable conventions. Okay, rather than trying to sum up anymore, maybe we should just turn on the lights and if there are any questions. Yeah. 